Good morning. Welcome. Somebody's going to say someday, this is not church coffee, right? <laughs> you're all awake. If you're not, go get some coffee. You'll be all right. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And I was thinking, under these very bright lights here, um, that things might look a little different if Thomas Edison never existed. It is said that the famous inventor made thousands of trials before he got the light bulb to work. There's a story told. One of uh, his workers, someone he gave a task to, came to him and said, Mr. Edison, it can't be done. He said, how many times have you tried? 2,000 times. Go try another 2,000 times. You have only discovered that there are 2,000 ways in which it cannot be done. The same man said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So indeed, we'll talk about not quitting on Christianity today. So last week we did Acts 16 and Philippians. Right? So there we saw what it was to be a committed Christian. So this week, we'll look at the letters Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, and we'll say a lot of names that are fun to say. So <laughs> we'll see that they're facing persecution and suffering, just like in Philippi, but it's worse. So we'll look at some ways in which we can maintain our strength in Jesus and through the church so that we don't grow weary and give up. So when arriving at these letters, I have to uh, contain my excitement. I love the Word of God, I love the Bible, and I'm a Bible nerd. So when we get to these places, I'm like, oh, we're in Acts, and we can go to these letters. So we're going to arrive at these places where Paul was, right? Not literally going to arrive, we're staying, we're going to do it right here, from here. <laughs> but when we're going to look at these places, Paul goes to them, but then later writes letters back to them, or some of them. And so we're going to look at them both. And last week was really cool because we got to see some common things, common people. You understand what the backdrop is and what Paul is talking about. So let's hop right into Acts 17 if you're following along. Um, we'll hop right in. So after Philippi, they leave Philippi, Acts 17.1. Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom he, custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, three weeks in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they are here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. The people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. Okay, quick notes here. Paul and Silas, again, so same traveling companion now, right? He's done with Barnabas over the thing with Mark. Uh, you see prominent women. Luke wrote this. You see them in the Gospel of Luke. Remember, he says the women were supporting Jesus in the ministry. So Luke mentions this a lot. We saw Lydia, if you remember, right? So she's selling the expensive purple garments. And so she had a home and invited Paul to stay with her on her own initiative, not unlike getting her husband's permission or something like that. So prominent women you're seeing here. Luke makes sure to mention them. And now we see this persecution. We even say they're mistreated in Philippi. They're mistreated here too. So I'm going to kind of summarize the rest of the chapter because we're going to go back to Thessalonica. But there's the rest of the chapter. We want to honor that. So that very night, they send them out. They're like, go. So they go to Berea. Long story short, they get to Berea. And in Berea, the people are very different. They examine the scriptures to see if what Paul is saying is true. Good practice. If you've been here for a while, what do I say? Don't even believe me. 
that's what this is for, right? Check my work. And so he checks my work. <laughs> and make sure you get it right, right? So you should always don't rely on any man, any person. We make mistakes. We can be wrong. Ask my wife. So just, <laughs> just read that, okay? It's a big point here. But if you see a ministry like Berean ministry or, you know, Berean church, what they're trying to say is they care about the word of God. Probably a good place to be. I don't know. Anyway, so Here's what happens. The Jews in Thessalonica, they follow them there. That's what ends up happening. So they leave uh, Silas and Timothy, but Paul goes on to Athens. And so it says, when Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he sees there. So what happens is he's having these debates. He's wherever anyone would listen to him, like out in the city square. He has these debates with like the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. So <clears throat> Luke makes mention, like they just care about all the Athenians, care about all the latest like, you know, stuff, teachings and stuff like that. And so they bring him to a high council. And this is fun. Areopagus. Areopagus, not Snuffleupagus. Areopagus, right? Wow, so many people knew what that was. I didn't think like you were all that old. Anyway, <laughs> it's Arios Pagos in Greek. It's um, like the hill, the hill of Ares, the war god. Uh, some people say Mars Hill, and I, I don't really know enough about Latin stuff. Like it's the Latin equivalent, but it's not Ares. And so when people say like, Mars Hill, I'm like, that's not what it says. It, that's Latin, so maybe it comes from there, but that. This is Greek. It's Arios Pagos. So the hill of Ares is where he is. And so a pretty prominent place. They gather together. And Paul displays, I'm not going to read you. It's a very short sermon. Uh, but he gives a speech. And it's really interesting because he, he approaches this in a very, very interesting way. Um, <laughs> and when you talk to scholars, it's, it's typical rhetoric, right? So he says, men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. Right, so he's going to throw him a compliment. Some uh, Bible versions might say like, superstitious because they're catching on to what he's saying to a believer. It's like, yeah, you're very religious. But they would have taken this as a compliment. So he gives a speech, but he says, you know, I was walking by and I saw this altar and it said to an unknown God. This is the God that I speak of. Paul's really smart here, right? So flattery, right? <clears throat> so he uses the flattery first. Then he's going to kind of get something he can work with, right? And he gives a speech basically you know, let me tell you about this God. He made everything. You don't worship him and he doesn't live in temples. He's bigger than all that. He made everything. I'm waiting for the time here for you guys to repent and come to him. Uh, he says something interesting. From, it's used a lot in, in a good way. Uh, from one man or one blood, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. And so this is very interesting too because what is he doing? He's breaking down these racial divides. Right? He's saying we all came, like as Christians, this is what we should believe. We all came from one man. right? So we're, yes, the nations and all these other things, but no, we're all one in Christ Jesus, like Galatians 3. So he uses it. He gets to the resurrection, and that's when some of them are like, what? You know what I mean? What are you talking about? Right? So he kind of loses them a little bit there. Some laughed. Some wanted to hear about it. But it says that some, more than one, join him, Dionysius and Damaris. But it also says some others uh, with them. And I just always find this funny because I hear a lot of people that talk about it, and they, they chalk it up like it's Paul's failure. In Athens, I've, I, you know, maybe, you know, other people, if you've been a pastor, you've heard that, right? Like, you know, Paul really failed, and he only got two followers. Well, first of all, um, <laughs> it says some others, right? So, and, well, every soul saved is important. That can't be a failure, right? If it was just one of them, right, Demers, that's it. But uh, one of them's like a leader, like a <laughs> Areopagite or something like that. It's a very complicated word, which you don't see it in many translations. But he's one of the leaders, this Dionysus guy. And so he converts a leader. So I want you to think of this. And I just think, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but I think there's this culture of belligerence in Christianity, right? We, we always want to be, like, at odds with people and argumentative. And, you know, and none of those things are Christian qualities. They're, they're not good. So we should do it like Paul, right? You try to find something to work with, right? Compliment the person. Like, nice shirt, right? If I say that to you a lot, there's probably something wrong with you, right? So, <laughs> no, don't worry. But, right, I'm always trying to look for something. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we won't talk about the hat again. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I will make fun of you. I cannot help it. It's in my nature. I'm fighting. But anyway, uh, you know, but come on. You know, why, why do we want to come at people like this? And so that's why I think they downplay it. I really do. I think a lot of even pastors downplay this. They dismiss this because they're like, nah, it's not the way we want to do it. Right? So, like, just think of this. I just want you to just think of this very quickly. I'll take a minute. But, you know, like, think of it like we know that there's a gathering of Satanists. You know what I mean? So we know there's like, right, because it says Paul's disturbed by the idols, false gods. 
So we know there's going to be a gathering of Satanists. And what are we going to do, right? We're going to go there with our, you know, pitchforks and torches. Right? We're going to go there with our signs, you know, like Satan, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, all this stuff, right? We're going to yell at them. We're going to get ready to argue with them. We're going to practice our apologetic points, our apologia. We're going to get real good at that. We're going to be able to defeat them in every argument, you know. And we're going to be rude and nasty. But, like, think about it. Showing up and be like, you know, like, I show up. And I'm like, <laughs> Satan worshipers, right? I can see that you guys are really religious, that's great, you know what I mean, like, you know what I mean, like, but that's what's happening here, like, think about it. that's what's really happening here, and then, like, the leader of the satanic cult goes, you know what, you're right, I'm going to follow you, Gene, I'd, be, I'd say, just that one guy, that's a win, right, that's a win, but you go there with a sign and all the stuff, you're going to get nobody, right, nobody at all, so just a point I want to make to you guys, because I'm just seeing, I'm seeing it a lot, especially with what's going on, I'm not going to talk about, it. we come here to talk about Jesus, it, it, things come and go, the, all these bad things are going to happen all the time, whatever. But you're going to hear about it a little bit. We come here to get away from that. Like, let's just get to the Word of God, get centered, get peaceful, just be one in Christ together, right? But there's so much of this, like, angry preaching and stuff, and it's just not good. I don't like what I'm seeing out there. So, um, all right. So Paul will write a letter back to the Thessalonians, all right? So this is said that it is one of Paul's first letters. All right, the place is really called Thessaloniki. That's fun to say. Thessaloniki, it's Alexander the Great's sister. It's named after her last week, uh, Philip, Philippi, Alexander the Great's dad. So these are prominent cities. So writing to this city, first Thessalonians, <laughs> Thessalonians 1.1. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. So here... We see that. So you see these people together, Paul, Silas, Timothy, kind of like co-authors-ish. He's just, you know, he's going to set Timothy up for success when he sends him there. He's one of me. Uh, we saw Silas in Acts, grace and peace, very common greeting for Paul. So I'm going to summarize some of this for you and then just hop in on certain scriptures on our train of thought today. So he praises the faith of the Thess Thessalonian believers. Now I'm messing myself up. All right, so same kind of themes as Philippi, right? So we have this uh, faithful work, enduring hope, imitating us, imitating Paul, Silas, and Timothy, right? So, and as a result of this, he's letting him know, he's complimenting him. You know, everybody's hearing about you. Of all those in Macedonia and Achaia, remember? Philippi was in Macedonia, Achaia, we're going to get to that in Corinthians. And so now the word of the Lord is ringing out uh, to you, from you to people everywhere, and they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. So you see the same thing here going on. It's a really common theme throughout the whole New Testament. Jesus is coming back. Jesus, we have hope in Jesus coming back over and over and over again. That's what we set our sights on. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1, you yourselves know, dear brothers and sisters, that our visit to you is not a failure. You know how badly we have been treated in Philippi. Remember that, see? Oh, it's amazing to read these things together because now it's in recent memory. Just before we came to you and how much we suffered there, they're in prison, the stocks, they bring the house down with the worship regardless. Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. So you can see we are not preaching with any deceit or impure motives or trickery. For we speak as messengers, it's very interesting here because in the Greek it says apostles, but it's like lowercase a, it means sent one. Remember, that's the closest thing we have to missionary in the Greek. Approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. Never once did we try to win you with flattery, as you well know. We know if we read Paul. Uh, and God is our witness that we're not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. As for human praise, we have never sought it from you or anyone else. So, we remember Philippi, familiar themes of suffering, uh, not being like those false teachers, right? So, we're not doing it for money. We're not doing it. So, anytime you see Paul, it, it, it creates a lot of issues for people if you don't understand the whole thing. But he's trying to show up the false teachers. Like, I'll just go and make tents, whatever it is I'm going to do, and, and preach. But, so anyway. And we'll see in uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, actually, it causes a lot of problems for him. But anyway, he's trying to show up the false teachers. Uh, and remember Galatians. In close enough memory, right? I'm not seeking prayer. I wouldn't be a servant of Jesus Christ if I was trying to please people. So same things over and over again. All right, so if we just jump down a little bit. You yourselves are witnesses, and so is God, that we were devout and honest and faultless toward, toward all of you believers. And again, imitating them, suffering persecution, and important here, God will bring the justice. That's a big theme. It's going to grow in 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Again, what will the reward be when 
Jesus returns. The heavenly prize. That's what they're supposed to focus on. And just towards you get to the end of this chapter, just a quick note. If you're, uh, I use an NLT because everybody understands it. And then, like, when it goes a little bit off, uh, I think and I just go back to my Greek Bible and I put what it really says in there. So if your Bible, this is what I would call an innocent idiom, right? So there are many departments of the Bible uh, translation people. You know, like, they'll have, like, a whole group working on these letters, another group, working, and they try to gloss it over uh, with, like, a literary English person or whatever. But sometimes they're not, like, thinking about the whole thing together. That's why you got to really, like, read the whole Bible, like, a lot. Because it says, yes, you are our pride and joy. That's an innocent idiom. We say that, right? You're my pride and joy. But pride is always a sin. In the Bible, it is always a sin. So you can cross this out because it doesn't say that. It says you're our glory and joy. But that's weird in the English language, right? You're my glory and joy. But that's what Paul says. He does not say pride. There's different words for this kind of stuff or arrogance, alizonia. It's not there, right? So glory and joy is what is there. Um, and then in other places, like he'll say, uh, kafima, you're my boast. But some translate it pride. It's not what he's saying. There are different words for that. Iperifanos and alizonia. So arrogance and pride. You didn't even need to know that. First Thessalonians 3.1. Finally, <laughs> when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens. And we sent Timothy to visit you. He is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. We sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you are going through. But you know <clears throat> that we are destined for such troubles. Even while we were with you, we warned you that troubles would come soon or soon come, and they did, as you well know. That is why, when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. I was afraid that your, the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. But now Timothy has just returned, bringing us good news about your faith and love. He reports that you always remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us as much as we want to see you. So, we have been greatly encouraged in the midst of our troubles and suffering. Dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in your faith, it gives us new life to know that you are standing firm in the Lord. As you remember, he's uh, propping up Timothy in Philippians, so it's the same type of thing. He's sending people to other places, right? Paul, he has concerns here, right? So anxiety. We're going to see that. Paul, we saw it already, remember, about Epaphroditus. He had this, like, anxiety about him. We're going to see 2 Corinthians 11. He's doing what's called, like, the fool's boast, to kafima. And uh, he goes through all the things, the shipwrecks, the beatings. And not only that, but all the marimna, like, the, all the anxiety I have over the churches. It's a natural human response, right? So he's worried about them. They're like children to him. So the big thing here is, you're finding it, this is the crux of his concern. And you can see it here where you look at the whole thing. This is really what it's about. What is this letter written for? What is the subject line in the email? Well, he's worried that they're going to give up. They're going to fall away from the faith because they're suffering persecution. That's it. That's what you should be thinking of, right? So this is what's going on here. Uh, but note, he warns them. This is not fine print Christianity. Too much of that going on today. Not fine print. He warns them. We warned you. You were going to suffer. It is going to get bad, right? So we'll talk about that later. But relax. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so... Chapter 4 begins with encouragement and right living, being holy, uh, that is set apart, right, for God, uh, staying away from sin, and, uh, and this one, I like this, 1 Thessalonians 4.11, make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business. Just soak that in, please, all right? So then working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. But just read 11, okay? Just, you know what I mean? Like, soak that one in. Mind your own business. So we can have less meetings, right, about other people. So, <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. Let's get serious. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. So again, we have what? Hope in Jesus, even in death. He's coming back. So this is how he's reminding them. Even if you suffer, he's coming back. Don't worry. Even if you die, he's coming back for you. Don't worry, right? So everything that could happen, that's all this is here. Now, just a quick note, because some crazy people uh, will, and Tony knows I'm going for it, <laughs> they will make this about what it's not. I just told you what this was about, right? And you can clearly see and hear what this is about because you, you read the subject line. Like, you know what's going on, right? It's getting bad, but don't worry. Jesus is coming back. That's it. Take that. Leave. Like, that's it. Just the rest of the scripture. Done. But people draw this into this, like, kind of, like, pre-trib made-up rapture thing. It's like, I don't know. I know where they get it from, but that's a real stretch for this text. A real stretch. It doesn't, it's like, what? You know, it doesn't say anything about the tribulation. If anything, from his letters, if we're reading Greek, it says you're going to go through tribulation. You're going to go through tribulation. That's the word for the suffering there. It's horrible, right? So we got to that. I talked about it. We did Matthew 24, and I showed you if you just read the text being, like, taken or swept away like those in Noah's day is not a good thing. You don't want to be taken. Yes, throw the movie away. So it's not, it's not going to happen. It's, it, the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, Jesus says, you're going to go through it. He says exactly the opposite if we're listening to him. So it's bad. Just a real short thing uh, without getting distracted from our point today. Basically, like the term out to meet him in the air, like think about it. It's, it's like uh, they would say that in other literature of that day. For example, you'd have a king coming back from battle victorious. We're going to go to meet the king in the air. You know? So we have things like uh, walking on air. I'm walking on air, right? So something like that. It's, it's like that. It's like being elevated, lifted up. Yeah, you know, we're going to go to heaven with Jesus, but it, it's not, that's not the point and purpose there. The point and purpose is Jesus is coming back. So Paul continues. He doesn't get into all that. He didn't need the digression because people never took it that way until 1850 and beyond. So <laughs> he just continues where he should be going. First Thessalonians 5.1. Now concerning how and when this will happen, they don't, they don't turn the page. When it's all been, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them, and as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. Not all the women are like, that's not how it happens, Paul. But anyway, <laughs> and, there will be, and there will be no escape. But do you get his point? What's the point? Unexpectedly. You don't know, right? So here's the thing. We've been through this, but this echoes what Jesus says. The apostles like, what? When is it all going to happen? When's the kingdom going to come? Jesus is like, we don't know. It's not for you to know. Not even the Son knows. Okay. We got that from Jesus, right? If you've been here for a while, you've heard that. Only Jesus. Wait, only the Father knows, he said. Almost messed up. Only the Father knows. Jesus said he didn't even know. So how can we know? And why is everyone saying they know? Nothing has changed. That's it. <laughs> it ends here. Why are there people saying they know, right? So it drives me nuts. All end times prophecy outside the Bible is always wrong. That's the common denominator. It's always wrong. It always has been wrong, but people go crazy with this stuff, and I'll tell you, it drives me nuts, All right? So it's called faith. It's not for us to know. Yes, so imagine that, right? We're supposed to have faith. And here's the other thing. This is why, because I want to game the system. Live in the light. Pretend like Jesus is coming back now, now, now. Now, and with every terrible conversation you have with people when you're yelling at your husband or your wife, no, Jesus is coming back now. That's the point. If you think like that all the time, you might be a nicer person. But people don't want to be nice. So, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, but you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. And don't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. It says it again. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and night, so be on guard. Do not sleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmets the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us <clears throat> so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up as you're already doing. Again, you don't know the time. You do know he's coming back and just act like it's now and now and now. And you'll be ready. So <clears throat> things in the meantime, put on the armor of God. Sounds like Ephesians 6, right? But we just get one of the pieces. He's just quickly saying that. 
Put on the armor of God for yourself, for others. What do we, what do, we do with others? Fear monger, right? Get them riled up and angry. No. <laughs> encourage, encourage. Peace, peace, love. We are peacemakers. Encourage with love. Just love one another, please. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5.12, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. And live peacefully with one another. You guys can absorb that one too. Just take that one in. Especially you know, verse 12 right there. <laughs> you, know, you got that. Okay. So you guys treat me great. I just, it's not, I'm not saying anything bad about anyone in particular. Except you. No. no he doesn't. <laughs> okay. Again, don't, don't be lazy. We have a rapport. If you're new, it's okay. Right? Don't be lazy. Dear brothers and sisters, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and all to all people. And to all people. Right? And now we come to the shortest verse of the Bible. It's going to blow your mind. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, I, it's like a setup. It's like a setup. So I have this imaginary daydream where I'm on Jeopardy. And it's like, doo -doo -doo -doo. And like what is the shortest verse of the Bible? I'm like, <laughs> and I write bit all my money. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, right? And they're like, no, we're sorry, Pastor. You're wrong. It's John 11.35. Jesus wept. And I'm like, nope. No, it's not. In the original, it's shorter here. And then we get an argument. And later, like, they have to give me my points back. And I lose. But then I win. And it's like this whole thing is never going to happen. But anyway. <laughs> this, is, this is the shortest verse of the Bible, just so you know. You see how excited I get about, like, the Greek and all that stuff? It's almost unnecessary. All right, so, <laughs> so, so right, rejoice always. How, <laughs> how are we going to rejoice always? But remember, Paul was anxious. He just said it himself, right? It's the ideal, right? That's what we should. So even in all this stuff, come on, let's just rejoice. Let's have joy, guys, even in the worst stuff. Let's just shoot for the joy. That's what it is, both sides of the coin. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. This is important to remember. So remember those false fear monger, you know, prophets. They come up with things. Test it. Test it. You hear something? Test it with this, like the Bereans. Be a Berean. Test it. Really? And if you read just this letter, you'd be like, uh, no, kind of says you, you don't know, you can't. Like, what are you talking about? False teacher, false prophet. All right? So Paul's final greetings, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way and make your whole spirit and whole soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord uh, Jesus comes again. So you see the theme there. There it is. Again, God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful to your brothers and sisters. Pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a sacred kiss or a holy kiss. You don't have to do that to me. I command you in the name of the Lord, read this letter to all brothers and sisters. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So again, are you seeing it? Yes, live blamelessly while we wait for Jesus in peace. Imagine that. And like I said last week, right, they read these letters aloud, not one line at a time, right, randomly out of order. They would read the whole letter, just like we did, almost. Let's just hop into 2 Thessalonians. Similar themes. I'm just going to go through it, kind of paraphrase it for you, show you a couple of verses. But I want you to see, I want you to see what's going on here. It's building. 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. This letter is from Paul, or sorry, 2 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Sound familiar? 2 Thessalonians 1.3, dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and, you, and your love for one another is growing. We, and I had a nerd moment, couldn't help it, cross out proudly, boast, coffee mug, it says there. Uh, to God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom. 
That's interesting. For which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and to those who refuse to obey the good news, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. And this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him. All right, so same themes again. You're suffering, but now do you see the more of the emphasis on Jesus' justice? Right? It's getting bad, so he's going to, don't go after, don't repay evil for evil. Remember, you read that? Don't repay evil for evil. Just, Jesus is going to take care of it. He will bring the justice, right? So be it, in the meantime, be at peace with everyone. So the bulk of the next section is what happens when Jesus comes back, what Satan's going to do in his operation in the whole thing. And he's just, let's clarify some things about Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say the day of the Lord has already begun. Ooh, don't believe them, even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or supposedly a letter from us. Don't be fooled by what they say. You absorbing that? Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed, driven to anger, right? You need to be ready, right? We're going to start a Christian army by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Have you heard that one recently? Right? We're in the end times. You heard that? False. Don't, right here, look, read. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say the day of the Lord has already begun. No, <laughs> right? Don't be shaken. Don't be fooled. What did it say? They're going to come back. He's, right? He's going to come back unexpectedly. Right? So but they get caught on all this stuff about Satan, but they don't read this. Right? So he's going to, the abomination, all this stuff is going to happen. and You're going to see all these bad things. Okay, great, great, great. But what does it say? The man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth. That's what it says. Go to verse 8. Right? So, yep, man of but the Lord Jesus will say, well, what do we do? We wait peacefully and patiently. There's nothing else to do because the Lord Jesus has got it. So many please say amen like this. <laughs> like, right? Do we believe this? Do we believe this? Like, or do we believe that Jesus has got it? He will slay him with the breath of his mouth. I believe that, so I'm good. Like, you're going to get yours, fine. You know, it may not be the nicest way to think, but I'm like, I pity people. I'm like, oh, no. You know, you're going to get it. So he does the slaying. Believers should stand firm, right? And then he asks for prayer for them. Pray, too, that we will be rescued from wicked and evil people, for not everyone is a believer, but the Lord is faithful. He'll strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. Uh, we get more exhortation uh, for proper living, like live properly, imitate us. We see that in the next section, imitate us. Uh, it says something that makes me laugh every single time. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command, those unwilling to work will not get to eat. No potluck for you if you don't help out. Like, no pizza. <laughs> like, imagine me saying that. Like, no, nope, no, nope, this person does not serve. Like, I have not seen you serve once. <laughs> it's biblical. I've never deprived anyone of pizza. That's just crazy. I talked about pizza again. Second Thessalonians 3, 3. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Ah. Never get tired of doing good. He gives some final greetings in his own handwriting. Uh, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Don't grow weary and give up. Don't give up. Paul is concerned they'll quit. They may be growing weary, right? The sufferings, the death, the work. Don't grow weary and give up. Is that verse 2 Thessalonians? Do we have it there? 3.13? Oh, it wasn't 3.18. So first line there. All right. My mess up. But focus on that line there. That's what I was... As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Paul gives this long game hope. 1 Thessalonians 4. Like, even in death, even if you die, it's all right. Jesus is going to bring you up from the dead, and you're going to be with him forever and ever. Right? And then all these questions, right? Paul knows they're asking him, right? Well, what about these people who did all this harm to us? And we even see it in Revelation. 
the white robes, right? The beheaded one, right? Rest, I got it. I'm going to come back and get everybody, right? Assurances regarding this justice over their persecuted, but they're growing weary, and we see that escalate in 2 Thessalonians because of what Paul's saying. He emphasizes that just it seems like things are getting heated. Paul is trying to get them and us to focus on the long game. Focus on the long game. But here's the problem. People generally don't like that. We don't want to talk about the long game. People want quick fixes, instant gratification, especially in this day and age. We don't get it right away. Like, I'd fall for it too. <laughs> Come on! You know what I mean? You're going on a different computer. My, my computer is so fast because it needs to be to keep up with my mouth. Right? So anyway, <laughs> my brain works really fast. So like, you know, it's fast. Right? But if I go on somebody else's computer, I'm like, Come on! You know what I mean? Like, what's wrong here? You know, it just, it's only taking one second, right? So I know, I get it, I know, right? Everything, it's right there, right? It's right there. We have all the answers right there. But the problem is, this leads to this quick fix culture that we're in, right? We got a pill for everything, you know? We have to exercise. I try to exercise that way. When stuff goes wrong, you know, I'm like, wait, wait, just pray, pray, just pray. Like, hold on a second, you know? We run to the doctor and give me a pill, quick, give me a prescription, make it go away. You know, it's like just everything's fast, 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 fast. And then it, that, that's like the diets, right? And, you know, like a 30-day fix. Like you've been spending 20 years of your life ruining your body and we're going to fix it for you in 30 days. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> All right? But wait, 60 days, more believable. 90 days, a year? How are you doing with the New Year's resolution? Then you don't have to answer that question. But I said it. <laughs> so people are trained to become weary of these. Like, right, you know, if they're not getting it right away, I give up. You know how to deal with it. It just takes too long. You know, I don't want to do that. This is the concern. We do it too. We grow weary in the waiting. We get tired of waiting and we quit. It's like me trying to find a parking spot. So I'll just go right back home. So I get it. <laughs> That's why she drives. Again, people like this instant gratification, right? And the world is ready to sell it to us, right? They're ready to sell it to us. And so we have all these alternatives, right, competing for our attention. But here's the thing. It's really funny because psychologically, like, when you think about it, they've never worked for us before, which is why we're looking for another one, right? <laughs> they don't work. Generally, they just don't work. So why do we keep seeking them out? Why do we do that? Like, we know they don't. Has it worked? No, because you wouldn't be searching for another solution if the other one worked. So we know. Well, here are some reasons, just some observations. And, you know, I've done, I've done it too. So if I say you, it's me, it's everybody. So, right, it's like the gym membership keychain thing. You know? <laughs> right? I checked the box. I'm in it, even if I'm not, right? I'm in it. I'm doing it. So it's a checkbox, and we've got to show everybody we're trying. It's got a mask, like, don't, 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 I'm trying, at least I tried, that's what you could say, at least I tried, that's it. it. Makes it feel good. Generally, they're easy, that doesn't challenge you really, really, well, even if it's just a time frame, let's say it's a hard workout program or something, you know, but maybe a diet, but they're easy, right? You can eat whatever you want, you know, just control the portions, and you'll lose 20 pounds, you know what I mean? It's like, it's easy, it's not, this is not going to be challenging, awesome. Unless you're my wife. She does all the challenging challenges. It's crazy. <laughs> but, for the moment, but, but even then, the time frame is very short. Oh, cool, you know. I'm going to look awesome in four weeks. It's only her. Like, she's the only person who does that, and it works. So just don't listen to anything I say. I'm not listening anyway. <laughs> but anyway, but in general, you know, I'm making a generalization here. So we joke about this all the time. So it's okay. You're probably like, oh, is he talking about our weight? You know, it's like, <laughs> don't worry. We're good. Um, doesn't really challenge it. It's not long, right? And here's the other thing. You can blame the diet. I've tried everything. I've tried everything. Nothing works for me. You hear that? Nothing. I've tried everything. Nothing works for me. And even if it could work, here's the whole other thing. We may not be ready to grieve the old us. Think about it. We're comfortable this way. I don't want the expectations to go up. 
So we'll just stay this way and say we tried. That's why we keep doing it. Now, unfortunately, this has made its way into mainstream Christianity, right? We have fad Christianity problems. And so, yeah, like the fear-mongering, that's one of them, right? And we're going to give you a quick fix, and this is what we are going to do. We're not going to wait for Jesus. We're not going to be patient. Right? No long game, no long game. No, 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 no. He's coming back. The end times are now, and you're going to be ready, right? Like, it drives me crazy. This is how we're going we're to prep. We're going to do this. We're going to do that, and we're going to control the whole situation. What? The world's going to melt. Read your Bible. It melts in flames of fire. Don't get scared. Uh, so, you know, but that's it. But then Jesus is going to come back. That's it. What are you worried about this stuff for? Be patient, peaceful, wait for you. No, they want fat, instant gratification. This whole end times thing is a fad. It's a Christian fad. It did. It started in the mid-1800s, and the rapture got invented and all this other stuff. It's a fad. It's a fad Christianity. There's a new one, like, it just keeps coming up every day. It's not new, relatively. We even have, like, the fad Christian diets. Ever hear anyone say, and if you did it, just relax. I'm not talking about you. But if you talk to me about it, it's you. So, like, you ever have <laughs> the Daniel diet? <laughs> the Daniel diet, right? Do you, right? So it's 10 days. And what I hear is, I'm going to blow this on day 11. That's what I hear. That's like all I hear. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm going I'm to ruin myself on day 11. That's a fad. Read Daniel. I'm not going to tell you what happened, but read how committed they were to that. It was just a test. 10 days was a test day. Right? But then they kept doing it for a long time. Right? So call me in like three years, right? We have, I know, and it's worth mentioning here, we have the verse of the day problem, right? We do. We only want to commit to one line of the Bible a day. Oh, come on, is that not ridiculous? Yes, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous contextually. It's stupid. Like, these people post these verses, they sound stupid. Like, it's like, that is not at all what that means. It sounds dumb. I'm going to say it. The Bible actually says stupid in it, so it's okay. I didn't say a bad word. <laughs> But you got to think about it from where I stand, right? You know, it's like, I, I know, I read the Bible, like, a lot. But still, like, you know, I'm reading about the old church, what they did. They're reading these scriptures to everyone all the time. I'm like, that's great, right? They're all interested. You know, and I get up here and I, like, think about it. Okay, awesome, right? So I want to encourage you guys, if you came, it's, I'm so glad you gave an hour or two of your time, whatever, if you're going to do the potluck. I, I'm just, even an hour, even just listening here for an hour, I appreciate you. I really do. And there's no but. That's it. Just, I just appreciate you guys. I love it. The problem is, like, I will get new people that come in, and they have the Bible tucked under their arm, right? And they all look like the perfect Christian family. I'm like, oh, here we go. They come in, they listen, and they're like, that was just too much scripture. They start looking bored while I'm reading the Word of God. Right? That was too many scriptures. Too many scriptures said no committed Christian Ever. Ever. I could just read you the Bible for one hour, and you should be fed, satisfied. It should be like perfect, James. You didn't tell any of your stupid jokes, right? That, that, should, be, that should be the thing. That, yes, it's better. It's better. This is better than anything I can say, right? I'm trying to relate it to you. You should shut up, <laughs> right? But think about it. Like, think about it. That's a big problem. This person has been bought into this fad Christianity so bad that the Word of God sounds foreign to them. What? It's not even Christianity anymore. It's just not. It's not a committed Christian. So it's the same thing with church. Why people do it? Well, I check a box, right? I check the box. I showed up on Sunday, I checked the box. Or not, right? But then I put the Jesus fish in my car. We've already talked about that problem. So that's like the keychain ornament that you have from the gym. It says, I'm a Christian, then you cut people off and embarrass me. But gee, the same thing as the gym. <laughs> not in shape, don't say you go to my gym. So, at least I tried. At least I'm trying over and over and over and over again for years on end. At least I'm trying. The other thing, you can blame the church. Never had anybody leave the church and say, yep, my fault. I just want to sin. I just want to go to another, <laughs> I just want to go to another place where they don't challenge me, right? I want to go to another place where he didn't like just, I don't know, just like the Holy Spirit, I've read my mind, he's talking about my sin. I don't want to hear about my sin anymore. I want to be told I'm getting everything right. Maybe they'll put me in leadership even though I don't even belong there, right? Maybe they'll let me sing even though I can't sing except in the shower. You know, not even your dog thinks you're good. You know, they'll let me do <laughs> what I want to do. They'll let me do whatever I want to do. 
and make me feel great. Don't challenge me, pastor. Right? Blame the church. Search fault. And then there's always some... People want a place they can be comfortable the way they are. But we do say, come as you are. I welcome anybody. I don't care what your sin is. I don't even care. Just murder would be like a little weird. Like just, I got to look out for the flock. But like anything else. So, <laughs> so you know, it's fine, right? <laughs> no, there are a couple more that I just don't want to hear about. But anyway, <laughs> you get my point. <laughs> Speaking in grand hyperbole. So, big words. I was told not to use those. So anyway, <laughs> come as you, I love you. I love everybody. It's fine. I've just been there, done it. I get it. Right? But don't stay as you are. Don't stay as you are. We want to see some progress. Not perfection, but progress. Most people don't want to grieve the old them, so they just stay complacent. I mean, you know, and they'll go wherever they can feel complacent. But they've set themselves up for failure. That's where fad Christianity gets you. Failure. And some, sadly, fall away from the faith. So that's why Paul gives the warnings. He doesn't want them to fall away. I told you. Our culture has a major commitment problem. It's all got to be instant. We don't want to commit to anything. We don't want to play a long game. No, 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 no. I need it now. But it's a problem. Paul, he's worried, right? It's, been, it's a human problem. But they're growing weary. They're getting lazy. They might give up. They're getting tired because doing the right thing can be difficult. So just a little application. How do we work through the hard? How do we do it? If you've been here for a while, you kind of know, but it might not have been codified for you. So first, knowledge about what you're getting into. That's important. How many Christians have you seen in the Christian community? You've been a Christian for a long time. You see people get baptized, like, and you really know, like, they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea what they're signing up for. They don't know what Christianity is. Knowledge. What did Paul do? He, Paul said, I told you. You're going to experience suffering. So a lot of churches just say that. Okay, I'm going to baptize you, but you're going to experience suffering. <laughs> no, you don't hear that. Right? We don't hear that kind of honesty. You have this fine print baptism. Well, you don't read that. <laughs> you know, they just dunk you. But then what happens? What do you see happen? Before I really started thinking about this biblically, I don't. Know, most of the people I've baptized were the part of the. I don't. The, I don't even know if they're going to church at all. Why? Because something bad happens and they go, you didn't tell me about that. Or this doesn't work. I got sick. They told me I'd never get sick again, right? But I got sick. And so they fall away. My dad died, you know. Like, yeah, that stuff happens, right? It just, that's life. So it's exactly why we here draw your attention to the fine print. And so it's kind of like a change since the martial arts industry, right? So that we have this big, it's called an assumption of risk, right? Because you can't waive your right to sue. So <laughs> you make them sign an assumption of risk, and it's hilarious. Like we just, it was almost a joke. Like we were just like, okay, four-point font. Let's say all the craziest stuff we can possibly say, right? You are going to die if you do this. You're definitely going to die, right? It's worse than skiing. You're gonna, I'm going to try to break your leg. Therefore, it is going to break. You're going to look different. It's going to be horrible. Like all these things. We even had, and this is true, about the foul language, right? We were mentally callousing you, right? <laughs> you know, for, and it's true. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it was all in there. It was all in there. Craziness. But what did I say? I was like, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> just sign up. Give me your money, right? You don't, you don't need to read that. They should have read it. <laughs> it was really, really dangerous. It's to beat the heck out of people, right? So, you know, like, it was dangerous. But what did I say when I wanted to do things for money, like the false teachers, right? You don't, you don't need to read that. I don't know how many times I'm going to stop that. Right? Whatever. Just sign up. Everybody signs up. Okay. Sound familiar? Very much unlike Jesus. What Jesus said. You want to follow me? Oh, oh, Peter, right? <laughs> Deny yourself. Don't be selfish. You can't follow me if you're selfish. Pick up your cross. You're going to suffer and die for me. Then you can follow me. That's exactly what he said. He made people consider. Right? Let me bury my father. Let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Right? I want to put his hand to the plow. Starts to work, then looks back. Not worthy of the kingdom of God. Get on the move now. I want to follow you, Jesus. 
Foxes have their dens. Birds have their nests. But I'm homeless. You're going to be homeless too. Peter says, we've given up everything to follow you. Commitment. What king with 10,000 soldiers goes to war against another king with 20,000 soldiers without counting the cost and getting counsel? It's a lot of warnings. I could keep going. There's more. Right? He, it's not fine print with Jesus. It's like all capital of a 16-point font. It's right there. But so many people are baptized without it. So you, you have to know. So what we have is, and you go on the website and see it, we have a baptism statement. You can, you can see what you're committing to. And in recent times when I was like, this church has got to be biblical. If you've been baptized more recently by me, well, what did you get? You got an email and you got this whole thing you had to read, right? And then what do we do? We affirm it. I make you say yes. Do you believe this? Yes. Do you believe this? Yes. They're the core tenets of Christianity. And here's the other thing. It's like an assumption of risk. I force you to read. Listen, the enemy will attack you. When you get baptized, you are going to be under attack. And so I make sure, I meet with every person I baptize, and I make sure I sit them down and be like, okay, let me explain the armor of God. You got that on? You better put it on. You have accountability people. Do you have someone you can go to? I can't be that person for everybody, so we need someone. If you're a woman, I'm not that person. We've got to buddy you up with someone that you can talk to that's going to encourage you and coach you through this because the enemy is like a stage 10 clinger ex-girlfriend <laughs> or boyfriend, right? If you knew that movie, it's, yeah. So, right? He does not, when you say, I'm out, I'm out of this relationship of sin with you, Satan, I'm out, I'm going to, I'm in a relationship with Jesus now. He's going to want you back. He's going to want you back. And when you do that in front of everyone, he is coming after you. He's coming after you. You need to hear that. You are going to suffer some things. And so what are you going to do? We're going to armor you up, man. We're going to make sure that you understand this. You're armored up. You have people that come and encourage you. That's important. And so it's in the baptism statement, and it goes uh, way, way back because they're biblical. So I use a, a very old uh, uh, baptism. It sounds nice and formal, right? You know, but in it, it says this. You're asked these questions when you get baptized because the early church asked these questions. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching? In the fellowship, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Will you continue in that? If you say no, I'm not going to dunk you. That's it. You're not, we're not going in the water today. Nope, because it's not going to work. I've never heard anyone get baptized like that. I'm like, wait a minute. But then I started looking at all these old church things. I'm like, oh, what the Bible really says. I'm like, you need to be asked that. That's what they did in the church. That's why it's on the outside wall right there. If you're not going to do those things, this will not work. I don't want to see anyone fall away from the faith. I'd rather see you just go away, get mad, wait, hit a bottom. I'll pray for it to be a high one, and then come back, and we'll try again. Rather than fall away from the faith. It's biblical. This is what they did in the early church. Now, window into next week. Relationship is key, right? You, got, you need to hear that. But there's stuff we have to do, as we've seen in the Bible, on our part. There just is. Right, so we're saved by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ. Relationship is key. But work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? So we need to work. We're saved by grace, but Ephesians 2, keep reading. It says we're created anew in Christ Jesus for good works. We're supposed to be doing things. The Bible also commands us. So we're going to look at Hebrews next week. Jesus is better than everything. I love Hebrews, right? He is the head of the body. We are the body of Christ. To be detached from the body of Christ, you are detached from Christ. Makes sense, Right? The very definition of church is to assemble together, right? ecclesia. So it's in the baptism statement. It's important, but I want to give you a window, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of good love and good, of love and good works. So love, not anger, violence, like no. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. He's giving them hope. Does, does it all just sound very congruent when you read more? When you take the time, like it sounds just like, what? Didn't we just read that? And yeah, we did. Over and over and over again. It's very redundant, but for a good reason. This is what God wants you to know. This is where 
He wants you to have your peace, your hope. So many people are just, just suffering under this anxiety, the bad anxiety, you know what I mean? Like not fear of the Lord. No, it's not that. It's anxiety, they're going to come and get my money. And then instead of having good teachers say, no, 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 don't worry about your money. It's, it's going to just, uh, moths get it, you know, rust. No, no, shh, it's okay, be at peace. God loves you. This is like just this much, right? It's just this much of your eternity. Don't worry about it so much. You fight? No way. There's nobody like Jesus. Jesus, we can't kill anyone with the breath of our mouth. Like, that's cool. Better than Godzilla, right? So, you know, it's just have some humor. Have joy. How many times have we read about joy? Laugh together. Stop. You know, I just, my heart for all of you is that you would find peace in Jesus. We would live at peace with one another and others out there. And just try to get them, get, let's, come on, let's get them in a church, get them in a Christianity. Peace. It's okay. The stuff that's been going on, like, where is that? And so it's just, you know, as a pastor, to be real with you guys, you're my family. And just that encouragement, it hurts me to just see this pain and this anger and this, oh, that's not what this says. That's not what God has in store for you, okay? So just hope, just live in that hope with me. Join me in just living in the hope of Jesus' return. If you have any takeaway. So real quick, look, this is the place we come to do that. If you're new here, this is a place of peace, right? So this is just come here for encouragement, reassurance, and food. So you're going to be told about the food afterwards. Join us in that fellowship. Eat with us. Break bread with us. I want to get to know you, right? So you got to give me like 10 tries on your name. I'll get it. But, <laughs> but I want to get to know you. We're family. We eat together. We have fun together. We have joy together. And yes, if you're suffering, going through things, we want to know about it. So you're going to be told how to connect with us if you are not new here among us. And as you know, First and Thess well, Second Thessalonians says, if you're being lazy, like you want to serve, <laughs> you, can, you can connect with me. Hey, the Bible said it, and I did too. So, <laughs> but we encourage you to get plugged in. Get out of your own head. You just go serve some other people. It'll bring you peace, I promise, all right? So I just love you guys. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone in the <clears throat> sound of my voice, hearing my voice. I pray for everyone who couldn't be here, anyone watching online, Lord. I'll let it reach them too, but just, Lord, bring them your peace, your grace, your mercy, your love. Let them feel it. That's my prayer. Just open their hearts so they can really experience it. Not just hear about it, but just experience it. So just let them just surrender. Just hand over all these horrible things to you, Lord, so you can heal them. Let the Holy Spirit dwell in them and just solve all of this for them. And then, in turn, turn them into vehicles of grace your love, your joy, your kindness, your peace, all that patience that you fill uh, spirit-filled believers with. And they can be vehicles of that all for the sake of your gospel. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.